This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Do you wish your family life could be a little more organized and a lot less hectic? Now there's an easy way to make it happen. The Skylight Calendar. The Skylight Calendar is an innovative, smart, all-in-one touchscreen calendar that automatically syncs up existing calendars your family uses. Everyone's upcoming events are automatically organized and displayed for the family to see in big, easy-to-read color-coded time blocks. And with Skylight Calendar, you can assign household chores to your kids, keep grocery lists, plan dinners, and much more. And Skylight's mobile app keeps your family up to date on the go, anywhere, anytime. Managing a busy household just got a little bit easier with the Skylight Calendar. Now get $15 off your Skylight Calendar when you go to skylightcal.com family. Go to skylightcal.com family for $15 off. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash family. Need a winter holiday escape? Forget your cares in Fiji. White sand beaches and scuba diving are calling. Your tropical paradise getaway is just one nonstop Fiji Airways flight away. With round trip fares starting at $899 from LAX or SFO. Or check out great fares to Australia and New Zealand with seamless connections via Fiji. Book now at FijiAirways.com. From here to happiness, flying direct with Fiji Airways. Good evening, everybody, and welcome welcome to Calling All Creatures. I'm your host, Lori, and we're back tonight to educate you and take you back to school. And uh, we're going to do our little Rattleology 101 class tonight. And so joining me tonight on the show, we have Dr. Randy Aronson with Paul's Veterinary Center. And then we also have uh, Jay Smith, who's dog trainer, rattlesnake avoidance trainer with uh, community dog training. So I'm going to go ahead and have both these gentlemen introduce themselves and uh, tell you a little bit about them and uh, what they do. Uh, let's go ahead and start out with you, Dr. Aronson. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, so my name is Randy Aronson. I've been a veterinarian for 40 plus years, um, just a little bit before the light bulb was invented. Um, I um, and my wife run Paws Veterinary Center, which is an integrated veterinary practice. And that means we combine the best of Western and Eastern medicine. And I've been involved in uh, the rattlesnake situation since obviously I've been in Arizona since 1981. And yeah, <laughs> thanks, Jay. Um, and uh, yeah, we um, just as a little back history uh, that supports what Jay does. When I had my practice in Green Valley, Arizona, we would have 30 to 40 envenomations a summer. And when we started rattlesnake avoidance, uh, we were down to three a summer. And so I can't tell you that the best uh, situation for rattlesnakes is preventative situation and using um, someone like my friend Jay to to, uh, rattlesnake avoid, uh, do rattlesnake avoidance with your dogs. All righty. Jay? Go ahead, Jay. Hello, my name is Jay Smith. I've been dog trainer here in Tucson for over 25 years and doing rattlesnake avoidance training for that, even before that. Um, I, I do a lot of in-home work with people with fear and aggression problems. I uh, volunteered for prison programs, teaching inmates to train dogs, also with youth programs. And so I've been uh, working with dogs now for quite a long time and, and snakes quite as not quite as long but i know a little bit about snakes more about dogs well that's that's okay i think between all of us we all know a little bit about snakes anyway so <laughs> yep. all right so what are some of the different types of rattlesnakes that we have out there well there's uh, uh the most common which is the western diamondback and then there's a the Mojave rattlesnake, which is another common snake here in southern Arizona, as well as the sidewinder, another rattlesnake, and the Arizona blacktail, which is a little bit higher elevation rattlesnake. Um, I know I've missed a bunch because there's about 16, I think, species yeah. of rattlesnakes in, in Arizona, the blacktail, the Arizona black western rattlesnake and, and there's the twin spotted the masaga 
prairie. So, but the most common are the Mojave, the Diamondback, uh, the Sidewinder, and the uh, Arizona Black Tail. And most of the rattlesnakes have just one type of venom that um, affects. I think it's what the nervous system for the most part for most of them. But the Mojave. No, actually, it's um, yeah. Actually, it's a uh, hematoxin, so it actually affects uh, muscles and capillaries and and whatnot. Um, the only one that, um, as far as the rattlesnake that we have to worry about that I know of, unless Jay knows differently, is the Mojave, which has a neurotoxin, which is the nervous system. Right. Yep. And that one actually, the Mojave can affect both systems, as far as I remember. Yes. But the other ones are just the one. So the Mojave is probably the more deadlier of, of the rattlesnakes. So, That's correct. Yes. So what are some of the things, Jay, that people can kind of do to help keep their dogs, you know, if they run across a rattlesnake, say, while they're out hiking or walking or something like that, what are some of the kind of... Pre- well, avoid straining is one of the things, of course. And then you can... You can get the vaccination, and and you can ask Dr. Aronson about what he thinks of that. Um, But most dogs get bit in their own backyard after dark, and they get bit in the face. So one of the things you can do is, of course, snake-proof your yard. And uh, before you let your dog out at night, turn on the lights. Make sure I take a walking stick and bump all the places where I think they could be hiding to see if I hear a rattle. And then I let my dog out. Yeah. Yeah, I think in addition to that, you know, as Jay knows and people may not know, you can't totally snake proof your yard. And we have a lot of people no. come in to the practice and say, oh, you know, we clogged all the holes into the yard. <laughs> and, you know, as Jay knows, we've had them drop in on trees and, yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. So, but he's absolutely right. Watching out and doing an inspection first is a really good step first. And, um, you know, the, the, you know, as Jay alluded to, the avoidance is really absolutely key. I mean, it is the most important thing you can do for your dogs. It's pretty effective. Yeah. And, you know, so Jay brought up the rattlesnake vaccine, and um, he, he probably knows how I feel about this. So <laughs> I, I'll just basically <laughs> – and Lori does also. Yeah. Um, rattlesnake vaccine, let me, let me give you a little backstory real quickly so people understand where this is coming from. Um, what they decided to do was take some of the toxin from the rattlesnake bite and make a vaccination out of it. Uh, this is done by Red Rot Biologics. Um, and as I told the story, we did this, uh, some, this uh, podcast once before. Uh, the lady who ran Red Rock's Biologics came into Tucson and left crying um, after a couple of us integrated veterinarians and a couple of the internists asked her questions that she couldn't answer. And the, the reason why we were so um, adamant about testing her situation with this vaccine is the way they developed this was they they basically uh, took a little bit of the rattlesnake toxin, went to southwestern Texas where rattlesnakes are just way more prevalent than they are here in Arizona, although uh, we still have a, a real issue. And they gave dogs this vaccine and basically – then asked veterinarians to comment on how the bites were after the dogs were envenomated. If anybody knows anything about double blind studies or, or, you know, basically testing things, there's no control in that situation because with rattlesnake bites, they can be a dry bite. It can be a young potent rattlesnake. It can be a, a rattlesnake that just ate and doesn't have a lot of toxin. And so there's no way to control how that bite affected the animal. And what happens with the rattlesnake vaccine is two problems. One is people think that their animals are protected and they don't need to get to an emergency service and get the anti-venom. Or two, um, toxin is, you know, like it's a protein basically. So in any protein situation, there are allergies to proteins. So if you get a little bit of toxin in your body, and then you get exposed to more toxin, you can develop an allergic response to that or allergic reaction versus just the bite itself. 
So I just wanted to mention that backstory with the vaccine. Um, I've never advocated the vaccine. I try to tell people, please don't waste your money on getting this vaccine. It's an abnormal protein that your dog doesn't need to have in its body, and it only can lead to problems. You know, I've actually had another vet t- tell me that they didn't uh, agree with that vaccine either, so you're not the only one out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Jay, back to the avoidance training. Um, what all does the avoidance training involve, and then how do you train the dogs to avoid the rattlesnakes? Well, I put a uh collar on the dog i take them up from the downwind side so the dog can see here and smell the snake and they usually upon approaching it rattles and the dog gets to where it can smell it really well so i allow them to collect whatever information they need and then i start at the bottom of the ladder on the electric collar um, with stimulation because some dogs are so sensitive that they the, the lowest setting will is almost too high some once in a while for some dogs so I start at the bottom of the ladder and work my way up according to the dog. Because what I'm trying to avoid is sending the dog into a triple twisting, screaming backflip in the direction. Right. Um, the, the dog literally thinks the snake bites him right in the neck. So uh, when I, if I guess the level right. And so we'll run away from the snake, get down, pet him, uh, let him decompress for a few seconds. Then I see if they want to go back up. What I'm looking for there is a the dog to look at me and go, buddy. You are out of your mind. Put on the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> then I hand the, the uh, lease over to the owner if they're comfortable around the snake. At which, at, at, but at this point, the dog's ready to go home. Um, and then I pick the snake up so that so the dog can see how it moves. Because when we first approach it, it's, it's just sitting there rattling, not moving much, but a tail and a tongue. And so that usually makes them want to scatter away. And then when we're, I'm sure the dog doesn't want anything to do with that first snake. I've got a second snake in a, in a mesh bag hidden. The dog does, won't be able to see it or hear it because we always get the rattle part of this training, but rattlesnakes don't always rattle. So I float them downwind. If they recognize that smell from their first introduction and show some type of avoidance behavior, they're done. If they linger or they're oblivious to that smell, didn't get a good smell on the first introduction, I, I can help them connect the dots. Sometimes by letting that snake in that mesh bag rattle, hearing that sound they didn't like in that first introduction with that smell and moving the bag again. Or I can bite them for smelling that smell and move the bag again, depending on how they took it the first time. So, so when they leave, they'll, be, they'll avoid sight, sound, and smell of a, of a Western diamond pack. All right. Now, I know your next question is, is that smell the same for all snakes i don't believe it is i believe to a dog the different species smell different well that would make I, sense I, I, I tend to agree with jay i think he's absolutely right yeah i think so too dogs know everything yeah <laughs> and well, we know little yeah. yes <laughs> well and as sensitive as but, their noses know, are i want to again remind our listeners that um, you know, Jay's type of training <clears throat> took my practice in, in Green Valley where we saw so many envenomations from 35 to 40 a summer to three. And, you know, if you were, we'll get into this as far as the expense and the type of treatment and whatnot, if you know all that's involved, if your dog is bit, it's so much worth paying the money to have someone like Jay who does this, does a great job doing this. <laughs> Uh, to have your dogs trained, then 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 I have to worry about the bite and and how to deal with it. Right, exactly. That's one of the reasons we wanted to have him come on and talk about avoidance training because yeah, it's a lot better if you can make them avoid it before they get bit than have to treat after they get bit. So absolutely. About how long does it take sometimes, Jay, if, if you have a dog that's not quite connecting the dots? Let's say so. About how long does it usually take for you to get through to the dog and get them to understand that they need to avoid this sometimes you know a dog will be done in five minutes and sometimes it might take 15 minutes and then i'll say you know what we put, we put the dog to enough hell let's let's wait a couple days and we'll, we'll do it try it again you can only stress them so far in one day or one time and then 
you know. So if they're not getting it, that I might do that. But usually when I think they might not have gotten it, they got it. Yeah. 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 Well, and it sounds like, like uh, Dr. Aronson just said, your uh, training seems to be pretty successful of the amount of bites dropped that, that much, you know. So. Yeah, I've been doing it a long time. And another thing that I can do is a lot of times I can guess which dog is going to be naturally afraid of a rattlesnake. There's, I'd say about 10 to 15% of dogs are naturally afraid. And uh, I bet I guess maybe 60 to 70% of those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's great when you don't have to use electric collar on a fearful dog. Not all dogs are good yeah, candidates that's... for this training. Right. And that's why you also, I may add, you want to use someone like Jay who has this kind of experience and, and you know, eye for this. Uh, the other thing that we get a lot of... <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, he's got a great flute. Um, but the other thing that you know that I want people to know is that um, people always, have, you know, say the first thing they say to me is, "Oh, I don't want my dog to be shocked by the shock collar." You need a strong avoidance, a negative avoidance situation. And Jay, you know, as most trainers do, use the lowest possible setting they need to make this happen. And it's really, you know maybe sometimes a one or two time and Jay may, may, you know, respond to this, you know, situation, but, um, the dog doesn't get hurt by it. It just gets a little bit of a key and that, and that usually is what takes care of it. Right. Uh Right. And, uh, do you offer, uh, people to come back and say, you know, if, if it's gone for a little bit to come back in and, uh, refresh the training? Oh yeah. I offer free retests. Uh, for the life of the dog if they want to come back anytime awesome they shouldn't have to go through it again yeah yeah they shouldn't have to i don't i know sometimes people bring them back just as a refresher just to make sure i think more for them sometimes than the dog but (laughs) exactly and then i get the guy that has to drag his dog up to the snake every year (laughs) when you can clearly see the dog got it (laughs) (laughs) so let's say uh Mr. Dog Owner is out there hiking with his dog, comes across a rattlesnake, and the poor dog uh, ends up getting bitten. About how much time do these people have to get their dog in to get treatment? Um, I know it can kind of depend on where the dog is also bitten. Like a face would probably be worse than, say, on the butt. Um, But about what kind of a time frame are they looking at, Dr. Aronson, to get in and get treatment? Well, the golden period is about four to six hours. Um, it could be longer, but, um, you know, that's, we tell people the most important thing is, is gather up your dog, um, try to have them do as little exercise as possible if it's a leg situation, um, and get them to an emergency service. Uh, there are lots of people who ask, and I know we'll get into this about home treatment and whatnot, there really is nothing that's effective versus having the dog appraised by an ER you know, doctor and whether they need um, rattlesnake you know, venom, uh, anti-venom or not. Uh, but things like Benadryl and steroids and all that do nothing. Um, and, you know, the old-time remedies of – I remember when I was first in Green Valley and I worked a little bit in Aravaca, uh, small community town. People used to talk about taking a car battery and putting it across the – the bite wound or, or, um, or crankcase oil. Um, none of this stuff works, honestly. The best is being appraised, and if the ER vet thinks that the dog needs antivenom, that's your best bet. Yeah, yeah. I know I've, I've heard people say that they've used Benadryl, but, yeah, that's I, yeah. we were going to talk about that, too. Um, oh, I was going to ask, I was going to ask Dr. Aronson, if you ever had anybody bring in the rattlesnake? <laughs> and you know, funny funny thing about that, Jay, is we had probably three or four Mojaves a summer that would, you know, bite animals. So, you know, if I knew it was a Mojave rattlesnake, um, I knew we were in big trouble. I mean, right. honestly, those are the dogs that really we have the most difficult time saving. Yeah. And it's not that it can't be done, but it's, it's really tough. Mm-hmm. So... Seeing the rattlesnake, um, and then I would just call the fire department and have them re, you know, repopulate the snake somewhere. Yep. 
Now, um, is the Mojave talking about the time frame to get the dog in for treatment? If you know it's a Mojave, is that time frame shortened because of it's a Mojave? Well, it, you know, I guess it is. It, it, you know, the only thing I would say is it's just important to get them as ASAP. That, you know, I wouldn't even put a time frame on these things. I would just say pick the dog up, get in car, get to the closest ER service. And one of the things I tell people to do is make sure – Somewhere on your, your, your on your refrigerator or somewhere on your phone, you have the closest emergency service to you uh, that's open 24 hours a day because you want to you want to have that number available as soon as you have this problem and not have to be you know looking for it at that point. Right. So um, I know we're talking about dogs, but what if you have a cat? What are you looking at then? Because cats are somewhat smaller. Yeah, it's it's um, you know cats are a lot smarter. <laughs> yeah, they they don't they don't tend to get bit. I mean, not that we haven't seen it because we have, but they just don't tend to get bit. Um, you know, there used to be a wise guy. I don't know if Jake can comment on this. Is that a lot of cats that are outdoor cats, if they can live in our environment, which is really tough, can uh, keep snakes away. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I Again, I don't know what about true, but. Uh, What's that? Do you see many uh, horses that get bit? Well, I don't see horses, so um, oh, okay. I can't I can't comment on that. I know there there are plenty that get bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what is the treatment? I know you talked about anti venom and stuff like that. So, what would be the treatment? Say, if in kind of a nutshell, I guess, if your dog got bit and you, they brought it into you, what would they be looking at having done with the dog? Well, we're not really an emergency service per se. I mean, we definitely see, you know, one or two rattlesnake bites per season. Um, the, the treatment would basically be uh, we would, you know, Im- immediately place an intravenous catheter, start the dog on fluids, and then give the dog the appropriate antivenom. Um, and the problem is, is that depending on the antivenom and whatnot that's out there, it could be one to multiple vials. Um, and it just gets ridiculously expensive. So we just make sure, you know, we go over th- with the owner what the possibilities are and uh, try to administer the antivenom as quick as possible. Yeah. So, you know, in our practice, the, the nice thing, Lori, is we have laser, we have ozone, we have some uh, things that we can use to really make the bite not as, not as necrotic or, or, you know, um, degrad- you know, degradating as possible. A lot of practices don't have that ability, but it makes it nice for us to be able to do that. Right. Yeah. Because, because that's one of the things that does happen a lot of times when they get bitten is that that uh, tissue and stuff dies around that bite wound. So. Oh yeah. So how bad have you? I mean, you, you, you you've only seen a couple. You said so. You probably haven't seen. Have you seen any that, in your opinion, were bad, or were they just? Uh, kind of a type of regular what you would normally see if a dog was bit. You're speaking to me or Jay? Oh, well, you, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I've seen, you know, hundreds. So I've seen plenty. Um, and, yes, I've seen everything from not so bad, you know, to uh, we're going to lose a limb or we're going to lose, you know, we're going to have some major surgery having to replace this tissue to a Mojave bite where we're going to lose the dog. Right, right. So, Jay, um, let's talk a minute, too, about with the avoidance training. Would that, that, per se, work for, like, a Gila monster or anything like that as well? Because, I mean, they don't really make noise like a rattlesnake. But well, would, they hiss pretty loud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you're not allowed to possess a, a Gila monster, so. Well, no, no, you know. You know, but I do do Colorado River toads. Okay, so how do you how do you do that for the toads? Is it for a, like more like a smell? It's more like a visual, because a, one toad can trample all over your patio in a matter of five minutes and leave scent all over your patio, and the dog ends up knowing what it smells like anyway. But it's more of a visual. They have to actually put their mouth on it. They can get an inch away and be okay. They just can't put their mouth on the toad. And so 
but the Gila monster you're not allowed to possess. You'd have to be able to do that training when you you encountered one. Right, right. And then, yeah, and I don't know if you'd really want to do that either since they are... And if, and if you give your dog avoidance training to every little critter out there, you'll end up with an emotional train wreck. Right. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. And just to put that out... Put it out there. Oh, sorry. Just to put it out there, too. You know, snakes, we're talking about dogs, but, you know, they're just as dangerous to um, horses and cats and, you know, other. Some people have popped like pigs and stuff like that. So, it's always kind of good to know a little bit about some of this and what they're looking at. But, um, so. I've been asked to do some avoidance training on some strange things. Oh, really? What what have you been asked to do avoidance training with? Um, turtles, um, a few times a, a, a fake skunk. <laughs> Any ex spouses, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Okay. I had a couple people offer to leave their spouses at my shelter a few different times in the kennels. <laughs> there you go. Somebody asked about javelina training. I said, I can't even keep track of these rattlesnakes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know that how, I mean, that might not work out well either, considering javelina and dogs don't really, I mean, I know rattlesnakes and dogs, but javelinas really don't like dogs. No. So that might not be a real good no. idea anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the problem with javelina is that, you know, dogs encounter them in the washes and they start chasing them and then they don't realize that the javelina is going to be a lot faster than they are. Yeah. And they usually get nailed, nailed on their back end that, you know, and the javelina has three and a half inch, like, you know, canine teeth that cause some really severe problems on their back ends when they get, when a dog gets bit by one. Yeah. We had a dog that got brought into the shelter uh, by a county officer, and it was ripped up pretty bad on both sides, actually, yeah. from Havelina. We luckily were able to get a hold of the owner, so we were able to get the dog to the vet. But, yeah, they they are pretty vicious when they want to be. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to try to contain one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I didn't even like trying to – we never really even tried to trap them as, as animal control either because, yeah, that's just not something that you're going to do. So with the Colorado toad, if a dog was to get a hold of that, Dr. Aronson, what would a pet owner need to do for those? Dr. Aronson? I'm sorry. Oh. I didn't hear that. <laughs> sorry. So if a dog uh, did get a hold of a Colorado toad, what would you suggest the owner does there? Is that necessarily a vet trip or can what what can they do to or to make it so that they can get the dog to the vet? No, the best thing you can do in that situation is to, to uh, you get a garden hose and, and basically flush their mouth out. You know, as Jay said, they leave their, their scent all over the place, but their toxins on the outside of the toad itself. It's produced by a salivary gland behind the eye. And the toxin is uh, what we call a cardiotoxin or a heart toxin. But the dog acts Basically, people call the most important call that they, or the most common call that they have to emergency services. I think my dog's got rabies because it's foaming at the mouth. And typically, it's in the summertime, and they've they've licked or hopefully not bitten or eaten the Colorado River toad. And garden hose washing their mouth out copiously, wetting them down so you bring their temperature down will save the dog's life. It's, yeah. it's most important to do before you even get to an emergency service. I've seen it work. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, I know we talked. We were talking about the avoidance training for a Gila monster, but say what if a dog does get out and get in a tangle with a Gila monster? Are they kind of looking at, I mean, is it kind of the same type of treatment as, as if they get bit by a rattlesnake, Dr. Aronson, or would that be something entirely different because of a different venom? Yeah, it's pretty different. Um, the toxin in the Gila monster is really not the biggest problem. The problem is that they have amazingly strong jaws and lots of sets of small teeth and their bite is very infected so it's a it's really kind of a mashing problem every gila monster envenomation with a dog that i've ever seen 
the Gila monster and the dog come into my practice together because <laughs> yeah. they don't let go. And uh, I've had to anesthetize the Gila monster and clean the dog's wounds, and that's how we basically treat it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming once you anesthetize the Gila monster, it gets to go outside. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, it's nationally protected, so we yeah. yeah we definitely get them released. Oh, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess I didn't realize, I don't know why I didn't realize that people, when the dog came in, would have the Gila monster still attached to it. Yeah, it's happened many, many times. I bet that looks a little funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably if it's on the nose, it would. Oh, yeah. It's usually around the face or on the side of the face or that kind of thing, yes. Well, yeah, of course, because the dog sticks his face down there to see what it is. Yeah, that makes sense. Jeez, I'm telling you. So, what, Jay, what type of dogs do you think are the best ones that go through your avoidance training that really pick it up quickly? The girl dogs. Really, the girl dogs? <laughs> <laughs> I just like, I like to make fun of the boy dogs. Oh, really? Oh, um, the, you know, the herding dogs are, are probably the, the ones that are have the most percentage of, I call them naturals, that are naturally afraid of the rattlesnake. You know, I was thinking you were going to say the herding dogs. So. Yep. yep. And, what and ones... the bully breeds, not so much. You know, they can be a little bit thick. The labs, the goldens, kind of thick. Hmm. Here, here's where I get to make fun of breeds. <laughs> so but I, yeah the border collies and the aussies you know they're they're just careful dogs so well they're just i think those dogs are just some of the smartest breeds of dogs there are out there anyway i mean <laughs> yeah and if you ever had i mean i've been around enough of them in the shelters and stuff they were always impressive to me as as to how smart they were and how quickly they could learn things so mm-hmm. they sure they sure can. You know, I would think. I would. I wonder about a hound. Have you had hounds in there too in your avoidance? Yeah. How did oh, they? Yeah, yeah. and and the, the, they got great noses. If you can, you know, sometimes the brain gets in the way of their nose. <laughs> usually, they do really well. Yeah. Yeah. See, I could see my pits not doing that well because, especially my one, he'd be like, "What? I'm not supposed to go near that, really?" <laughs> That's that's what you want you want them to walk right up to it the hardest dog to do is a dog that's scared of people because they're they're more worried about me than than the snake right that means that means i gotta try to hide and it's it's tough yeah really make that association and you don't want to make that negative association with anything else but that snake right right so are there any other uh types of venomous creatures that we know of out here in Arizona that people should kind of be aware about. I mean, I think we've talked on the first one, we spoke just real briefly about spiders because I don't think they were too much of a, a threat, I guess you might say, the black widows and the brown recluses. Right, and the scorpions. And I snake trained a dog and beagle in Marana one time years ago. After the training, it would alert its owners to scorpions on the kitchen floor. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. Amazing. I know, that's well impressive, yeah. And every, every, everything else, yeah. Wow. But, you know, the, the problem with um, black widows and brown recluses is their bites are, are bad for dogs. I mean, we often get a lot of skin and muscle, what's called necrosis or death and dying of the tissue. Mm-hmm. Uh, the brown recluses are the worst. I mean, we can see that muscle and tissue dying all the way back to the bone and sometimes they'll need to have reparative surgery afterwards but uh, as far as treating them initially it's it's really not that that you know critical because we usually don't know it's happened right away right well especially i guess if you have a furry dog you're not how you you're not really going to know you know until you right. it starts to come out and you see it So, was there anything else that uh, either of you guys would like to add? We've kind of gone over this a lot. Oh, I know. I was going to ask. So, about the about the Benadryl um, thing, 
why is it that some people think that that helps? Because I know, you know, it helps for like allergic reactions. And, but why doesn't it really help if they get bitten? Well, because, you know, Benadryl is an antihistamine and basically it's, it's going to reduce some of the redness and inflammation. <clears throat> but it also is, uh, it can create hypertension or high blood pressure in dogs. It just doesn't, it just isn't that much of a benefit to a dog that's been bit by something like this with this kind of toxin. So people think, well, I can get some Benadryl and just watch my dog. That's why we just basically caution them not to do anything and get them to an emergency service because in the long run, when you look at the statistics, the dogs that do the best are the ones that are treated very quickly. Right. I know I've, I've actually had some people that I ran into doing animal control that had dogs that uh, had been bitten and uh, they didn't do anything or whatever and the dog pulled through it. But I was like, you sure are lucky that <laughs> that they made it yeah. through it. Well, as we talked about earlier, remember, there are all kinds of bites. I mean, there are dry bites. Right. You know, there are snakes that have already eaten recently. So, you know, you don't know. That That's the problem. And why, you know, basically risk your dog's life guessing? Well, yeah, exactly. I had a, uh, someone here in town when I first started out that I'm pretty sure, if I remember right, the snake was a Mojave. I found it in the yard. They didn't know if it had bitten the dog or not, but I told him, you know, to get the dog to the vet just to be sure because it was a long fur dog. And they held off on taking the dog to the vet, and uh, they ended up losing their dog in the end. So, you got to really, you know, even if you don't know, you still should take the dog to the vet, at least get them checked out because you just never know. Right. That's correct. Now, we talked a little bit too about. You know, trying to snake proof a yard. Jay, do you know a little bit about how people can try to somewhat snake proof their yard? Or, I mean, I well, am. If they have a wall, uh, any foliage on the other side, um, the snake can crawl up any kind of a bush or a tree. Yeah. And, and can drop down on the other side. And of course, the screening on all your holes, but the gate, that's the hardest part to seal off. Right, right, because, yeah, it is harder to... I've seen people put, like, mesh screen and stuff at the bottom of the gates. I wonder if that's why they were doing that. Right. That's, yeah, that's probably what they were doing if they have an HOA. If you don't have an HOA, a double layer of, of uh, chicken wire works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've heard and seen people that put, I don't know, metal around the bottom of their uh, yard fence as well, you know, a couple inches tall or... Or, you know, maybe three, four inches tall or something like that. Well, the snake's going to run into it and it's going to stop it. And I'm like, that's not how that works. <laughs> I actually watched a red racer jump into it, trying to jump into a tree one time when I first started out doing animal control. So, um, yeah, they do. And I had, I had to get a rattlesnake off the top of a six foot brick wall. I mean, they get I've up there. Wondered, I've always wondered how high of a wall can I say a three foot rattlesnake climb is it two feet two foot six who knows I've always wondered yeah just how uh-huh. hmm. well you know I think it depends on if like you said there's any foliage or anything around that they can use as well but well yeah if, if there wasn't I was you know just the wall I, was, I wondered if they could like put their head up and scoot it up yeah, I don't know either. I, you know, this, the one that was on this wall, I mean, there was a tree that it was laying underneath of and sunning itself and, and sleeping. I maybe had just eaten a bird. I don't know. But uh, it was, I can't remember now. There was some foliage on the other side of the wall, but I don't know, you know, if the snake went up the tree to get up on top of the wall or, or how it actually got up there, to be honest with you. I just know I got called and they wanted me to remove it and it, the wall was taller than me. So, oh, yeah. of course, that was and fun. In a lot of retirement communities, the, wall are, the walls are two, three foot high. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And with broad iron. So, is there any uh, other precautions that people could kind of take out there when they're, I mean, 
maybe out walking or hiking and have their dog along. I mean, I know a lot of people that go out, take like walking sticks, stuff like that to kind of poke around. I'm assuming. You're sure by the snake guards for your legs. Yeah. You know, it's for yourself, protection for yourself. You know, that's one thing that I do. And I, and I walk slow and I look down. Right. I've known people that have literally walked almost right on top of one and never even seen it. It's easy to do because they blend in so well. Yeah. 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 And something I found out that was interesting, we talked about this in one of the uh, other podcasts. Um, I was actually at a herpetological like kind of seminar thing because I wanted to learn more about rattlesnakes since I had to remove them from yards. And found out that Mojaves aren't always the green color that we see them a lot around here. They adapt their color to the surroundings they live in. So other areas have different colored Mojaves, whereas we see a lot of the green ones here. So I thought that was always pretty interesting. So depending on where you live. Another interesting fact is snakes can go, a rattlesnake can go a year without eating. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Long time. Well, that's pretty interesting. I didn't know that either. So, I guess, gentlemen, I know this is going. This is like been a pretty short podcast, but I think we actually covered a whole lot of the stuff that we wanted to cover. Was there anything else that either one of you would like to add in there about any of this and uh, treatment wise or? tip wise or anything like that when it comes to snakes and your dogs i mean we know there's different types of snakes rattlesnakes here in arizona but i i would assume that for the most part beyond the mojave who had the affects the two different systems that the treatment would be pretty basically the same for the other snakes as well wouldn't it just getting your dog yeah, absolutely uh, yeah no, I think we covered. I think we covered it all. The only other poisonous snake that's out there that I know of, unless Jay knows differently, is the coral snake, and it's very rare. Yeah. Um, and it's a it's a neurotoxin or a nervous system toxin, very similar to the Mojave, paralyzes the respiratory system in dogs. Wow. They just don't carry as much venom, do they? Because it's right. a no, much they smaller. They don't. That's right. And they're a lot less common, you know. So yeah, I've seen it's, one. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say I've seen one, and that's that was it. Yeah. And the only thing I would say to your listeners is, you know, there's a risk in everything you do, and um, ships are safe at harbor, but that ain't what ships are for. And so I always I like to take my dogs out to the desert. There's all I know there's always a risk, but it's a risk I'm willing to take, I guess. Well, and hopefully with you being an avoidance trainer, I hope your dogs have had some avoidance training. <laughs> even, even trained dogs get bit once in a while. That is true. That oh, is yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, they may, may come around. Uh, that I can't even talk now. They may come across one that uh, they don't realize is there too. I mean, it can happen, especially if their attention's on something else or. Right. Even I mean, if they're out horseback riding with you or something like that, I'm sure too. Because if they're, especially if they like. You know, the ones that like to stay right under the horse, they got to watch out so they don't get stepped on as well. And even with dogs with extremely high prey drive, you know, you give them a little time, they'll go after a snake eventually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. So. Once in a while, they will. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, coming back on and doing this podcast again and uh, that that way people can hopefully hear us on this one i think the sound was pretty good so i have a friend that listens pretty regularly and she knows if anything's going wrong she cuts me and let me know so so hopefully we uh, got a little bit of information out there for our listeners tonight because it is warming up out there guys the rattlesnakes are starting to come out um i think i think you know about that too jay i've seen a couple posts from you yes so be careful, everybody out there, and uh, get your dog some avoidance training if you can. Go see Jay at Community Dog community dog Training, right? Yep. So go see him, and then that way you don't have to go see Dr. Aronson at Paws at a later time to either get that tissue, you know, taken that's, care that's of. What we, and, that's, what we, that's what we hope for. Yes, exactly. So 
Um, and again, like I normally do for uh, every time, I know I probably put all this information up the first time that these guys were on. I think that was almost a year ago. I'm going to go ahead and post links to their websites like I do for uh, all the guests again and get that out there for you guys. If you want to just go off of my Facebook page and go to their stuff and look at it, you're more than welcome to click off mine. But again, Dr. Aaron Sin is with Paul's Veterinary Center and Jay Smith is with uh, Community Dog Training. And uh, I appreciate you guys coming on again tonight. And uh, I know, listeners, it was a shorter podcast tonight, but we got a lot of good information out there for you guys. Um, so just... Finally talked a rattlesnake into rattling. Can you hear him? Oh, yeah, sure could. You know, I've heard that so many times. To... <laughs> After doing 12 years of... Uh, animal control and having to remove them you hear it a lot i was actually chased by a mojave once too wow yeah they're they're not nice when they get mad <laughs> yep they come they after seem to you be always mad they actually they do i think it's just their personality i don't think i've ever seen a mojave that was not mad to be honest diamondbacks i don't mind so much on removing them but mojaves yeah those little Thank buggers you. i'm telling you so, but again, guys, I appreciate you guys coming back on and uh, doing this. And uh, since we got through all the material here pretty quickly, I guess we'll just go ahead and end it. And you guys get an early night and uh, can go eat your supper or whatever if you need to yet. So, again. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Lori. All right. Thank you, guys. And you have a good evening. And thanks, all you listeners, to tuning in. You as well. All righty. Bye. Bye, guys. Um, Bye. Bye-bye. All you listeners out there, real quick, just wanted to let you know that uh, the upcoming uh, podcast for April 16th is going to be our horse rescues. I hopefully will be having Cindy Butieres from Heart of Tucson and Teresa Worrell and and, uh, possibly Steve Boyce on from Horse and Around Rescue. And uh, we're going to talk about the horse rescues and all the really good, cool things that they do to rescue horses and donkeys and stuff like that. And I know that uh, they've got some different programs and stuff out there as well that are really uh, neat programs that they have. So we'll talk about those as well. And then coming up April 30th, uh, we're going to be doing the breed-specific legislation. And uh, we're going to have Chantel from uh, Justice for Bullies on with us. And she's going to be uh, talking with us about breed-specific legislation, some of the myths about it, and how it affects everybody, and uh, especially the uh, bully breeds, because they are the ones that are most discriminated against at this point in time. So uh, that's going to be a really good uh, podcast. So hopefully you guys all listen in and and, uh, learn a little bit about that as well. And then uh, working on our May stuff coming up. So... Um, stay tuned. I'll be putting the announcements out there on Facebook. Uh, if you guys want to check out the Facebook page, of course, it's Calling All Creatures 19 over there on Facebook. And if you guys have any ideas about any guests or anybody uh, that you might want me to try to get on, if you want to shoot me an email, that's awesome. Uh, the email is callingallcreatures19 at gmail.com. So you can either do that or put something on the Facebook page. I don't care. And don't forget, we're out there on all sorts of platforms now, uh, iHeartRadio, Apple iTunes, uh, Spotify, Google. So you don't have to listen to us necessarily on here, but if you do listen on here, please hit that follow button and follow my uh, podcast. I'd appreciate it. And uh, again, I know we're wrapping it up pretty early tonight, but that's okay. We got had a good podcast and good guests on. And again, I want to thank Dr. Aronson and Jay for coming on and talking about everything again with us and getting that information out to you guys. And uh, don't forget, if you don't live in, uh, Jay and Dr. Aronson are in the Tucson area. If you don't live in Tucson, you can check with your local veterinarians. A lot of them uh, have uh, rattlesnake avoidance trainers that come in. And you don't necessarily have to be here in Arizona. They do have rattlesnakes in different areas of the country. Back east, they have eastern diamondbacks. Um, Florida area and stuff like that. And I think even where I'm from originally, Michigan has some rattlesnakes and maybe the northern part. So don't forget, uh, you can do the same things in, in the eastern states as what we do out here in Arizona. So 
um, any and refer to your uh, local animal shelters. Like I said, if you're interested in doing any kind of uh, uh, snake avoidance training, or not your local animal shelters, but I guess you could check with them as well, and uh, with your local veterinarians because they do have uh, a lot of information on different snake avoidance trainers and stuff. So, anyway. We're going to wrap this up for tonight. I hope you all have a good night. And don't forget to tune in in two weeks on Thursday, April 16th, for our Hoofing It With The Horses. All right, everybody, have a good night. Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions, and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing... Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today. Every day my employees get scam emails. I wanted to protect my business and clients, so I checked out CISA's Secure Our World. They've got four simple ways we can protect our businesses from online threats. Learn more at cisa.gov forward slash secure our world.